Hey, Bradley Zordreger here for another episode of Overkill Reviews. Before I get started, I've got a little bit of a personal update for you. Obviously the world's in a really weird place, like really, really, really weird. Fortunately, I've been lucky enough to continue my writing a little bit here and there. Actually, a while back I wrote an article about this band, Phalanx and Whelm, both of which are fronted by Keir Gilchrist from that Netflix show, Atypical. You should go check that out on Bandcamp. I've also recently written an article about With Without Waves, this prog metal band on prosthetic records who visited Tiger King Joe Exotic's zoo back when that was still a thing and i did one for hard noise about gun drummer he plays metal songs with guns like does covers of them and it's 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 really cool anyway if you want to follow me on instagram and twitter at at bradseed and follow my professional facebook page just search up my name bradley zordiger i tend to post these there and i would really appreciate the support and the and the follows and the likes anyway as always i'd also like to ask that you Follow us, you know, subscribe here, hit the bell to get the notifications. And if you have the means, we understand if you don't, but if you have the means, we would love to have you support us on Patreon. We're at a, an interesting time. I've been doing this long enough that I'm getting into the, the doubling up. I've reviewed a band and now I'm reviewing them again. I did that with Suicide Silence. Last week, I missed out on that on Trivium, which pains me because I do think that the last album was better than I gave it credit for. And I would like to do a redemption, but alas, sorry guys, I can't. This week is another repeat. Oh boy, I'm gonna talk to you more about that song later, I'll tell you what. But for now, it's the new album from the Black Valley Murder called Verminous out today on Metal Blade Records. You want the full bio of this band? Go watch my Nightbringers review. But a quick bio for you guys this time around. These dudes formed in 2001 in Michigan and signed with Metal Blade Records for their 2003 debut album on Hollywood and have been with them ever since. This is the ninth LP in addition to a couple DVDs, which is a pretty insane track record of staying with the same people. Actually, the fact that they have two DVDs is pretty much unheard of for a death metal band. That's because they quickly, quickly became an institution fighting off all these erroneous genre labels that were slapped on them based on the bands that they were coming up with in the time and playing with you know they got labeled as a metalcore band wrong a deathcore band also wrong these guys have always just been a melodic death metal band always have been always will be this is their second lp with the lineup from nightbringers given guitarist brandon ellis joined for that time and it also cements bassist max lavelle and drummer alan casty as the longest running members with these guys f you know apart from vocalist Trevor Sternad and guitarist Brian Eschbach who formed the band. Those two dudes have kept the band's sound pretty consistent despite all the lineup changes. The last album added some surprising influences. Now it's time to see will they continue that trend or hone it back in for their trademark sound. The band did a little bit of a bait and switch with the singles and I'll explain that more later but for now I'm going to start with what you know those singles. Child of Night has some like morbid angel vibes. It's darker than much of the album, which is saying a lot. The chorus chant of "iya iya" feels like you're having a, a, like a curse cast upon you. Actually, Behemoth have a similar incantation in "Heru Raha, Let There Be Might." I'm not sure. Did all these bands have the same teachers at Hogwarts or something? On the other hand, the title track feels as like straight up Black Dahlia as you get here. It's interesting. You know, people always say the bands are inspired by the Black Dahlia murder, but back in the day, I, I used to think that that meant that they were kneeled beside them, worshiping at the altar of At The Gates. But I feel that over time, these guys have really developed their own sound, which takes inspiration from that, but is a lot more technical. And I think that is really highlighted on this song. And let me explain that bait and switch a little bit. You know, most of this album is not the Black Dahlia murder as you've come to know them. I mentioned last time around that guitarist Brandon Ellis has like a huge heavy metal and rock influences but this time that is the rule rather than the ex the exception. Speaking of Ellis, there's a video he did for Metal Injection and where he's playing riffs that inspired how he plays guitar. And there was this Ingvi Malmsteen riff, which <sighs> Malmsteen's influence is all over this in terms of there just being neoclassical shredding. You know, sure, I could go with the likes of Children of Bodom who kind of became like the poster boys for neoclassical melodic death metal, but why not go all the way back to the source? I never really expected to be listening to the likes of Malmsteen as it's just like not my cup of tea, but even less did I expect to be listening to it when I was writing a review for a death metal band. Crazy. 
but I was. You know, so there's some mom scene here. There's some, some King Diamond, some Megadeth. The Wereworm's Feast is a strong example of that. There's this riff that feels like it's about to go into a proper thrashing, but then it, it hones it back in and it becomes this rhythm section for, for, this, for the solo. There's a riff composed nearly entirely of squeals, which reminds me of, you know, uh, Tornado of Souls, which is the, one of the most death things to do. Again, mega death, not the Schuldiner band. Um, those dudes really know the benefits of peaks and valleys. They shred more than their comrades in the big four, but they also allow like chuggier rocking sections. Speaking of those, uh, Sunless Empire and the Leather Apron Scorns are very much driven by what's not there over what is. They're, they're sparser and there are a lot of uh, chugging seconds chugging sections the difference between like the muted chug sections and these melodic riffs that they, they 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 swing in and out of really enhances the theatricality of these tunes i mean the latter song the leather aprons scorn has this like bass lead before they like add a slower palm muted rhythm section that that is joined by a second guitar as like a, a chugging harmony i guess but then slowly mutates it's this song building that is key to what makes Verminous work so well. The songs build upon themselves, you know, layer by layer and then deconstruct, sometimes layer by layer and sometimes like a bomb struck. I love the interplay between the instruments. These guys always have something different going on on each guitar and it's always, it always works really well together. Like the closer Dawn of Rats has one of the most slaughter of the soul riffs going on in your right ear well there's like this mournful black metal tremolo picking going on in your left ear and it just you have to pay attention to both you need headphones for this another example is that song sunless empire i talked about earlier they drop the trem picking down for like a lower note but it's got a similar effect where there's something interesting going on on both guitars it's really cool so despite all of this influence like from outside of death metal this album is kind of like harry potter's the mirror of era said and i'm probably saying that wrong sorry to all the harry potter nerds which shows you what your heart desires i swear when i was listening to this album looking for death metal i would only hear the hair metal the heavy metal the rock influences and then when i was listening to it for the hair metal the heavy metal the rock influences i would only hear no this is like very death metal as a perfect example, take the song Removal of the Oaken Stake, which has this like galloping energy that one very well could associate with Iron Maiden. But if you're listening to it in a different frame of mind, you'll hear that it's not that far off from Carcass's This Mortal Coil. Unfortunately, we're now at the stuff that's not so great. And if I'm speaking of Carcass, yep, I'm saying that this album with the ramped up rock influence could be the Black Dolly Murder's Swan Song. Similarly, it could be their Wolverine Blues or their massive killing capacity. This influence works really well a lot of the time, most of the time even, but sometimes it does bum me out as I want more typical Black Dolly Murder fare. And by that, I mean from Ritual moving on where they, where they keep one foot in their traditional sound and then they take the other one and they feel out, you know, outsider influences that you're like, whoa, did they really do that? You know, like the Death Spell Omega section on the last album. This time around, it's like they have one foot in Black Dolly Murder Fair and one foot in, you know, more traditional heavy metal, more rock vibes. But before they did that, they cut a few toes off of each of their feet and they threw those out to get their other, you know, extraneous influences. I'm not surprised with Black Dolly Murder going with the traditional heavy metal. The, the melodicism is very much in line with what they do as a band, but I do wish they had experimented more with the brutal stuff. I feel like they're one of the bands who could have both of those like far reaching, you know, polar opposites of the sound, but pull them together into something that makes sense. Take for example, the Leather Apron Scorns. The end has like this seesaw back and forth between like these suffocation, like palm muted, like riffing and this like heavy metal steez. Somehow it, it, it really works, but I can't imagine how much cooler it would be if they expanded that more all over the entire album. Verminous came out in the Chinese year of the rat, coincidentally or on purpose, I don't know. And the lyrics liken fans of metal to those creatures, rats, you know, rodents, uh, or cockroaches, those who live in like the dank, dark underground, living amongst the sewage, if not like lapping it up. The band do a really good job of building the world with like these soundscapes of, of water dripping and rodents squeaking and scurrying around, bringing the listener into the incredibly detailed cover art and the music keeps them there. Vocalist Trevor Sternad even continues to expand his vocal influences and inflections. Notably, there's some more thrash influences. There's some like Slayer-esque yells and even like Chuck Billy bellows. 
The melodies are often the less obvious picks. I feel like over time the Black Dahlia Murders at the Gates influences seem to go backwards. That's not to say that these songs feel like outtakes from With Fear I Kiss the Burning Darkness, but the melodies have over time become, as I said, less obvious and dare I say less formulaic. The album as a whole feels more progressive and as such took a while longer to grow on me. When I first heard it, I wasn't sold. Somehow, despite being less directly heavy and generally more upbeat, it's just as dark and dismal, perhaps even more so. It didn't sell me right away, but now I, I'm, I'm living in the world among the verminous. And I'm gonna give this album a solid four out of five skulls. All right, shout out time, which is even more important given the times because what else are you gonna do when you're isolating than listen to new metal? And I've got a lot of that for you. First up, we have Carnosis and their album Dogma of the Deceased, which came out on Satanath Records on March 13th. If you're watching this, you're absolutely gonna love that album, worth checking out. Next up, we have Benighted and their album Obscene Repressed. It came out April 10th on Season of Mist Records. The next album we've got is another April 10th one, Caustic Wound and their album Death Posture, which came out on Profound Lore Records. Special shout out for them, based in my hometown of Kitchener, Ontario, and they're always excellent releases. Speaking of nasty shit, we've got another one. 200 Stab Wounds, whose Piles of Festering Decomposition EP demo thing came out on April 10th on Maggot Stomp. We also have one more April 10th release, well kinda. Fange and their album Pudur came out April 10th digitally. Physicals will follow next week on the excellent Throat Runer Records. And finally, here are a couple releases that actually came out today, April 17th. They both have difficult to pronounce titles, so cut me a little bit of slack. First up, we have Aborted and their EP La Grande Masquerade on Century Media. And finally, Abysmal Dawn and their album Phylogenesis on Season of Mist. If you're digging Black Dahlia, you're gonna dig these guys. Anyway, I'm done telling you bands to check out. When you're done watching this, please leave a comment down below. Appreciate you so much. Hope you're doing well out there. See you later. Yeah.